Thank you for that very kind introduction, and it's an honor to have been invited here. And I'm looking forward to, to presenting this material to you. Um, I have been uh, studying the, uh, what I will call the Diné Yenisean hypothesis for at least uh, 12 years, and uh, the studying the Ket language for a lot longer than that, uh, probably over 20 years. And uh, this is the hypothesis that I will try to connect with genetic and archaeological data today. Uh, you know, more broadly than linguistics. Um, and uh, what is at the core here is that a language family that is very deep inside of Central uh, Northern Asia, uh, which is represented today by only one surviving language, Ket, as part of a language family called Yenisein, is genealogically related to a large language family of uh, Northwestern North America called uh, Na Diné, that has the big Athabascan language family inside of it. This is what we call the Diné and the Sane hypothesis. And I insist on calling it a hypothesis, and I plan actually to be the last mainstream linguist to accept this hypothesis after everybody else, but for reasons that I'll tell you by the end of the lecture. Okay. The linguistic evidence compiled, or at least published so far, uh, linking these two language families uh, include uh, over 100 uh, cognates in basic vocabulary. And a cognate means that you have uh, two words in different families or different languages that are um, uh, hypothesized or proven to have come from a single word in an uh, ancestral mother tongue of both of those languages or language families. So there are over 100 of these, and they show what I will demonstrate to be interlocking sound correspondences. That means if you have a uh, cognate, a word like cat, for instance, the k will be cognate, uh, the k will have a sound correspondence with a, 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 a consonant in the other language family, the a will also, and the t simultaneously will, that will occur in other combinations. That's what is interlocking. I'll show you some examples of that towards the end of this lecture. There's also shared complex verb morphology. Uh, that, that uh, is in, uniquely in these two language families. And finally, there are other kinds of ways of building words that are um, shared in these language families, like putting a fl on a, noun, on a verb root to make an instrument noun. And I'll, I'll show you a few of those as we go along. Um, let's get acquainted with the two groups and the two language families. Uh, the one that's more known in the United States is the Nadine family. Um, when we look at how Nadine languages probably fit into the peopling of the Americas, um, it looks like the earliest migration or migrations resulted in uh, very many language families um, uh, in uh, um, most of uh, continental United States, um, uh, Central America, and South America. Um, Lyle Campbell uh, uh, finds about 100, over 100 different language families and isolates in this area that probably go back to a lot fewer if we could go that far back. But Nadine is not known uh, or not even hypothesized to be related to any of these earlier uh, language families. And it is in between them and the later um, Eskimo Aleut family that came in with, uh, with uh, new types of uh, uh, ability to, uh, to uh, hunt in the open Arctic type of, um, of waters. So it is often thought to be the last American Indian group to have come over from North Asia. And there's actually ge uh, human genetic evidence that suggests that might be the case as well. So Nadine uh, consists of some internal uh, differentiation that may be as old as five, 6,000 years. When we, guess, we estimate how old a language family is by comparing the modern languages, it's, it's, a, it's a guessing game. And we could be off by a 1,000 or two years. But uh, this language family is certainly not only 1,000 years old, and it's probably not 15,000 years old, somewhere in the, the vicinity that I show here. Um, it consists of, um, of a, a one a clinket, which is one whole half of the language family, just that one language. Uh, and um, the other half is uh, Athabascan Eak. Eak is a language that became extinct in 2008. It's spoken by just a few people in the 20th century in this area of the Alaska coast north of, uh, of Clinket. And Eak itself is one half of this other branch of the family. The other half are the 30 or so Athabascan languages that are spoken from the Arctic Circle in Alaska all the way down into Mexico, in parts of Mexico with the Navajo and the various Apache dialects. Uh, and there are also uh, Athabascan languages on the Pacific Northwest coast. There were some ex now extinct in Washington state spoken. So this is actually the largest geographic spread of any uh, language family in the Americas uh, before the coming of the Europeans. 
and it has an important internal time depth of at least several thousand years. Yeniseian languages are spoken in an area of the central uh, Yenisei River. Uh, uh, and the, the language Ket, which is still alive, is only one of several languages, uh, all of the rest being extinct in what are, is called the Yeniseian or Yeniseic language family. And this language family is also, like not, not, like not Diné, is not uh, recognized to be related to anything else in the Americas. Uh, Yeniseian is not recognized to be related to anything else in North Asia. All of the other language families around it are extremely different. And even the hunting gathering sea mammal hunters on the Pacific Rim, who are sometimes called Paleo Siberians because they don't fit into any of the other bigger families in uh, North and Central Asia, um, even they are not recognized to be related to Ket. So Ket is a true language isolate in, in terms of Northern Eurasia. <coughs> And uh, you immediately see that when you begin to learn cat and, and hear it or speak it. Um, cat language has phonemic tones. Uh, there are four of them in the southern cat dialect. Sul, the high even tone, uh, compared to the, the abrupt tone, sul, or the rising falling, sul, or the abrupt falling, sul. Those are completely different words, even though they have the same consonants and vowels essentially in them. And no other language of all of North Asia has these kinds of, uh, of uh, meaning distinguishing tones. Only cat has these ones. And when you compare it with the Athabascan and Tlingit uh, languages, you find that all of the, all of the elements that, gave, uh, that are tonal in uh, Yeniseian have analogs, uh, uh, systematic correspondences to, um, to uh, 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 sounds in the um, Nadine languages. I will get into that. Uh, uh, when, especially with these two tones later on, uh, but to the falling tone um, in the in the Yenisei languages that are today extinct, um, one of them was recorded in 1970s, and we actually have um, audio recordings of it called Yuch. That that falling tone was accompanied by a closure of your throat, your pharynx. So that the word that means a holding hook in that language was Suh. You actually hear this consonant sound that dragged the tone down to becoming a falling tone. This is very common in languages of the world. You get a falling tone from a, a, an element, a fricative uh, element um, at the end of the word that, that later fell out. Well, that, that element is actually still present in the Nadine languages in the cognates of falling tone words in Ket. Uh, Ket is also unique in Northern Asia because it has the root of the word almost at the end of the root of the verb. Here you see it in red with a whole series of prefixes that show the subject and the object and the, t the tense, the time of the action, or uh, whether the action was completed or not completed. All of the other languages around Ket are exactly the opposite. You have the root at the very beginning, and then you have a whole bunch of suffixes that you put, almost like Tootsie Roll, uh, building blocks or Legos or something at the end of it. So Ket is, is radically different in this regard as well. And when you compare the Yeniseian uh, prefixing verb to the, uh, the Nadine prefixing verb, you find that you have the, the, the same prefix positions. You have cognate morphemes in some of those prefix positions. If you really study the, um, the internal workings of those language families, you'll find homologies there as well. So what's unique in, Nor in, in Ket in North Asia finds analogs in the Nadine languages, both in the, the tonal system uh, and also in the, um, the verb uh, system. Um, Yenisean speaking peoples today live in an area of Siberia that's probably about the size of California. But in Siberia, that's a pretty small area. Uh, in the northern part of the middle reaches of the NSA, already going up a little bit north of the Arctic Circle in, in some places. Um, uh, but there were Yenisei groups uh, far, much farther to the south that were recorded by Russians who came into this area beginning in the early 1600s and laid the fur tax on the native peoples, including the Kets. And uh, so we know that there were a whole group of uh, languages. And, and these other languages were recorded, at least in terms of their basic vocabulary, by explorers, by, uh, by Russian government officials. So we have uh, comparative data that uh, puts the Yenisei languages uh, much farther south and a whole family of languages. Uh, and we believe, because of place names, that their origin is in this area here. 
uh, and uh, we have river names that were adopted by the Turkic and Mongolic peoples who took over this area when, when um, pastoralism developed in uh, South Siberia. That, uh, but most of the river names are Native American. Just like in many American states, a lot of the river names are Native American and not from, from European languages. So this looks like is a place where the ancestors of these, of these Yenisean languages probably lived at about 2,000, 2,500 years ago. So we do have some internal time depth in the Yenisean language family as well. Um, cat language is interesting to study if you're absolutely unconcerned with whether it's related to any other languages genealogically or not. And even if you're not interested in a possible connection with Native America, cat language is very interesting to study because it is a language that was present in Inner Asia at a time when pastoral nomadism was spreading in the native peoples of East Asia. And so if you look at borrowed words into Yeniseyan, you can s help trace the history of ancient Turkic, Samoyedic, and maybe even languages like Xiongnu, we're not even sure what they were. Um, cat language has words that seem like they're connected with these other uh, language groups. Um, and very often we find a situation where you have synonyms of various sorts in, in cat language. Uh, for instance, like words having to do with the shamanism or, or the shaman self. You'll have a word like kut, or a root like this that uh, has definite analogs with this uh, inner Asian pastoral uh, language words having to do with shamanism. Uh, and then you'll have one that has nothing to do with any of the other languages around it. And when you have a situation like this, you very often find that uh, one of them is borrowed from one of the inner Asian languages, perhaps with the introduction of iron technology, which became part of shamanism among the cat, as you can see with this uh, reindeer shaman's crown uh, in this photograph. But the other one has a, has a cognate in uh, Nha Dene languages, like the word chen, which is present in all Nha Dene groups, Klinkit, Iak, and all the Athabascan languages, as well as in all the recorded Yeniseyan languages, um, in, in words meaning shaman. It comes from a root that means to sing in order to cure people, not just sing to have fun. That's a different verb. Um, yet Dene Yeniseyan hypothesis, which I've been studying, uh, is not my invention or my discovery. This is something that really has been around for actually, in, in a sense, hundreds of years. Because as soon as, as um, educated uh, uh, people began to come into um, this area of Siberia, uh, 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 explorers, uh, people who were documenting the native peoples and languages there, they immediately recognized, or they thought they recognized, that the cat people were very different than all other people around them. Not only were the cats hunter-gatherers instead of pastoralists, but the cats, at least to the Russians, physically looked different than the other peoples of Inner and North Asia. They physically looked like the engravings that the Russians had seen of American Indians. And so already in the 1700s, the cats were popularly called the Siberian Indians in, um, in this area of, um, of Asia, it, way before there was any DNA or any kind of a knowledge of that. And already in 1708, this is not that long after Thomas Jefferson suggested that uh, maybe the American Indian came over originally from Asia, um, a Dutch Orientalist, Adrian Rieland, uh, proposed that uh, cat people, uh, the Yenisean people, they're called Ostjaks at that time, uh, were, were maybe uh, cousins of peoples in Native America who never went over. So this was already a few hundred years ago that people suggested that. And already in 1923, an uh, uh, Italian linguist uh, uh, found some words that looked alike in Yenisean languages and in Dene languages, including the word that means people, Dene, uh, uh, which in Ket is Ding, meaning people. And on the basis just of those simil similar words, uh, which could easily be coincidences, he proposed that uh, that uh, cat is related to Athabascan and, and Clinket languages. So this is well, even before I was born that these things were done. All right. Um, today, there are only about 50 fluent native speakers. They're all older, uh, almost uh, past uh, the age of 60. They live in very isolated areas, and it's very important to try to do as much field work as possible when it's still able to uh, record a language data. And I, I've been privileged to work with some of the, the most talented speakers of this language in their homeland. And, and this is uh, uh, one of the native speakers, um, Tingdeliang, which uh, her, her name in Russian is Valentina. She, she is a magnificent expert. Uh, I've learned a huge amount from her. Um, the cat people live uh, near uh, or on the tributaries of this beautiful Yenisei River, which is one of the largest rivers of, uh, of the world. Now this, is, this photograph was taken over a thousand miles away from where it empties into the ocean, Arctic Ocean, and yet it's over uh, it's a couple miles across already uh, in, in this, uh, this part of its middle uh, reaches. 